Good morning. Welcome to the second day of our uh, annual safety conference. I hope you had a great evening. Um, before we go to the agenda of the day, just to remind you about a few practical issues. Um, Wi-Fi network, no password needed. You can find the Wi-Fi information behind your name tag, also from the screen. Uh, the same goes with Slido. You have address there and a code how to, how to log into Slido. And one more thing, be active in uh, social media with the hashtag annual safety conference. And we'd like to move on straight away to our first panel today. For that, I'd like to welcome Edward Chiofu, who at um, EASA is the Air Standards Manager. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Janet. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, before going into the wonderful world of, uh, of aircraft leasing, allow me to thank the gracious hosts, Traficom, for an uh, excellent organization here and uh, for, for the great hospitality they have shown us. So thank you very much for feeling us welcome and giving us this great place to, to exchange on such important matters. Uh, I'm Eduard Chofo. I'm here from, uh, from IASA to moderate a panel on, uh, on aircraft leasing. And uh, we saw yesterday two very interesting panels. And one of them allow us to glimpse a bit into the future and to see how uh, the digital transformation will impact us all and what changes are looming ahead and how much they will affect all of us and will affect this business. And we see that uh, not only technology is evolving, but also business is evolving. Uh, and while the, the changes and the promise brought by digitalization in many cases is yet to materialize, when it comes to, to changes of business models, they are already here because they have to be here since business has to, to deliver on its promise. Um, and one such a change is, is aircraft leasing uh, that is now being more and more used on the European market, uh, be it as a financial solution or in, in, in legalistic terms, dry lease, or be it wet lease, we are witnessing a significant increase of those, uh, of those activities. And to discuss on that, we have put together a panel that really brings quite a wealth of expertise in this area and will explore why we see such shifts as occurring when it comes to, to aircraft leasing, but also we'd like to see what are the safety implications associated with such activities. And we'll be covering uh, a number of, um, of different aspects in the panel. Uh, one being aircraft leasing from a dry leasing perspective, so leasing of the machines themselves, what are the safety and efficiency implications. We'll also look at the wet lease market uh, in terms of evolution and challenges. We'll see what is the impact of leasing when it comes to group operations. And of course, we would like to see uh, the perspective of regulators, the regulators' oversight implications of leasing, and of course, EASA's perspective, how we see this from a pan-European uh, point of view. Uh, as I said, we have a great panel put together. I would like to invite them to, to the stage. Uh, first one is, um, is Mark Lynch. He's Mr. Drylees coming from GCAS, uh, where he is Senior Vice President, Materials and Engineering Solutions. Uh, he will be joined by uh, Eugene Quigley uh, from CityJet. He's the Chief Operating Officer and Accountable Manager from CityJet. Uh, next to him, Cesar Holzem, uh, coming from Tui Fly, Germany, Senior Manager, Flight Deck Tui Fly. From the regulator side, Irish Aviation Authority, Mr. Piers McCran, Head of Air, Air, Air Operations Department. And last but certainly not least, since he's my boss, Mr. Claudio <laughs> Trevisan, uh, head of the Air Operations Department in, in IASA. Good morning. And I would like to start with, with Mark. 
and I would like to invite Mark to, to tell us one thing. GCAS is one of the largest aircraft lessors in the world. Uh, and what are the safety and efficiency implications for safety regulators and operators with the increase of dry leasing? Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Edward. And first of all, I would like to thank everyone in this room for giving me the opportunity to present to you. Uh, I know most of you are at the front line of aviation safety, and I know you take that responsibility both professionally and personally very seriously. As an aircraft dry lessor, we're a little behind that perspective. We don't have direct control of the aircraft when it's operating or on lease. And because of that, we have a slightly different perspective on aviation safety in the aviation market. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to present that perspective to you. And I'm going to, in this talk, ask you two questions about efficiency and regulation over the coming 10 years. So to start off, this chart is, is not going to be a surprise to anyone. Aviation growth has continued at about 4.5% per annum over the last 30 years, and it will continue on probably for the next 15, 20 at any rate. So that means, very simply, is that every 15 years, traffic doubles. So from 1985 to 2000, traffic doubled. 2000 to 2015, despite 9-11, despite the financial crisis, traffic doubled. Between 2015 and 2030, traffic will double again. And we're on that curve right there, right on target at 2019, where we sit at the moment. And what does that mean for us? We survived two doublings of traffic over the last 30 years, and everything continued pretty much fine, right? What does it mean, though, in 2030? Well, one of the big differences is, is that aircraft leasing has taken off over the previous 30 years. And we're at a position now where approximately 40% of the world's commercial fleet, most of you with airlines here will have leased aircraft, 40% of those aircraft are owned not by the operator, but by a separate entity, the lessor. And what that means for aircraft is that a typical leased aircraft will transfer maybe three or four times over its commercial life. It will transfer across a national boundary, going from one operator to the next. And interestingly enough, airlines themselves, instead of buying an aircraft and keeping it for 25 years, are actually trading aircraft as well. So they're getting and becoming a little more like lessors in respect to transfers. And the bottom line for us is that by 2030, we expect to have about 8,000 aircraft transfers a year. That means 8,000 times an aircraft will cross a national border going from one system to another system. So, we talk about the aviation industry as being global. But is it really global? Most of you flew here in probably a Finnair 8320. It may have had 180 seats in it. Guess what? That aircraft would be unsafe and illegal to fly in the US with the limit of seats in an A320 is 179. Equally, a 737 flying for 10 years in the US coming to Europe would be unsafe and illegal because that aircraft has only a 30 minute standby battery, not the one hour required under the EASA system. There's many more examples of this, fuel tank inerting, ozone converters, TCAS 7.1, even right up to today, ADSB. The ADSB system fitted to a European aircraft is not the same as the ADSB system fitted to a US aircraft. And this transfers throughout the whole industry, throughout different countries. We did, we asked a, a consultancy, SGI Aviation in, in, in uh, the Netherlands, to do an evaluation of what that actually meant, what this difference is, unharmonized standards actually meant. And they looked at it, looked at the transfer of aircraft, the flow of aircraft, the mods need to go on, come off, the loss of time in the aircraft, the cost of actually installing the downtime, <coughs> uh, installing the mods and all that. 
and they came to an answer that over the next 10 years, up to 2030, as an industry, we will spend between four and five billion dollars on unharmonized requirements. So my first question to you, if I stand before you now and said, we have four to five billion dollars to spend on safety over the next 10 years, would you agree that this is the right way to spend it? Now, things aren't all bad. There's been a, a number of very good things that have happened, and one of them is down to aircraft records. We asked in 2010 our customers how much did it actually cost to take a records into a, for a leased aircraft, to take the records into their system when they got a leased aircraft, and then to give the records back to us at the end. And the answer was $40,000 in, $80,000 out, about $120,000 per trans transaction. Multiply that by 8,000, and you get approximately a billion dollars per annum in shuffling paper. Now, that's not going to happen, because industry and regulators reacted together and worked together. And the first thing that happened was in 2012, IAZA set up a rulemaking uh, task force to look at aircraft records. And I'm really happy to say that in 2019, that's become an EU regulation, it's published, the guidance are there, and it's a model of clarity and simplicity and will become the gold standard for records globally. People listen when IASA do th does stuff. And I, I commend IASA for that. That task alone will probably save hundreds of millions of dollars over the coming years. Equally, ICAO looked at electronic records and issued guidance that electronic records are fine. Now, it may sound crazy, of course electronic records are fine, but believe it or not, some large authorities still will not accept electronic records. They still want boxes of paper. But I think we're getting there with IASA guy, our ICAO guidance out on that, saying what is acceptable for electronic records. I, I honestly think the back is broken on that one. And the final thing was industry got its act together and started helping each other. Ourselves, through the Air Aviation Working Group and IATA, came together and created a records, a standard records checklist of what we would expect when transferring an aircraft, and both bodies agreed to stick with it. So everybody knows what's required now. And in addition, we contracted with ATA, the standards organization in the US, to come up with electronic specification, spec 2500, for the electronic transfer of records. In other words, records can go from one electronic system transfer to another operator electronic system without being turned into paper in the meantime. So here we had a potential billion dollars a year, and by working together, we reduced that to something manageable and also something sensible, an efficient use of resources. Now, what worries me a little bit, and it comes back to Edward's first question to me, is a leased aircraft a safe as an unleased aircraft. And I guess the, to answer it that way, let's describe a lease transition. We have an aircraft. The aircraft is serviceable. It's got a C of A. It's airworthy. And the lease ends. So the redelivering airline then takes the aircraft out of service, goes through the aircraft and its records to make sure all the lease conditions are met, the authority that's exporting the aircraft then looks at the aircraft themselves, makes sure the aircraft is airworthy, all the records are fine. They additionally look at the importing authority's import requirements and then make a declaration on the export C of A to the effect that the aircraft's airworthy is safe and meets the importing state's requirements. The lessor looks at the aircraft, looks at the records, makes sure that the aircraft meets all its delivery conditions, makes sure the records are all right. The importing airline, it's going to lease the aircraft in and says, well, I'm going to make sure I get what I paid for. They look at the aircraft, they look at the records, make sure everything's right. And then the importing state takes the aircraft and says, well, this aircraft's coming into our system. We're going to make sure that everything's right and everything's good. And they take the export C of A and say, that's fine. Let's look at the aircraft. Let's look at the records. So five separate entities go and look at this airworthy aircraft just because a lease's end 
ended and the aircraft is transitioning. So the glib answer to your question is, yeah, at least aircraft is safer. Look at all these people staring at it. But the real answer, as we all know, is that aircraft safety depends on the operator. It depends on how the aircraft's maintained and how airworthiness of the aircraft is managed. And that's the real answer. And that doesn't make any difference whether an aircraft is leased or an aircraft is owned. But my point in respect of the issue I see coming up is that this activity, which I've described, with 8,000 transitions a year, that's 22 of these transactions every single day of the year come 2030. And is, from a risk-based perspective, is this going to be a good use of everyone's resources? Or are we going to tie up a lot of Aviation Authority resources in reviewing airworthy aircraft? Now, the Aviation Working Group, which we're a member of, has set up with ICAO a cross-border transfer initiative, XBT we call it, and we're looking at how to make cross-border transfer simpler. And one of the things, there's a couple of easy things to do, and, and they've been done. For instance, the export C of A will no longer be recommended by ICAO to include the importing states requirements. You'll simply make a declaration that the aircraft is safe within your own system. The second thing ICAO has done under Circular 95 will set up a repository where states can actually specify what their import requirements are. But for me, the big question is going to be, how do we deal with the resources to review the aircraft? Now, EASA and the FAA use delegation a lot. And one of the main successes of EASA has been the introduction of a CAMO system. It's worked very well over the last 15 years and has created an industry of responsible professionals looking at airworthiness of aircraft. And the FAA have a similar system, but delegation tends to be down to individuals rather than organizations. But most of the world doesn't have that. Most of the world has authorities carrying out the inspections themselves. And what we're proposing under XBT is that under ICAO's auspices, a single entity is delegated the responsibility to look at, the, at an aircraft transferring, looking at the export requirements, looking at the import requirements, and make a declaration that's acceptable to both authorities. In other words, freeing up authorities from spending their entire lives reviewing aircraft transferring. Now, if authorities believe that that's where resources are best spent, fine. But I'm really not sure it is. So anyway, that's my two questions and my two thoughts in respect of, of aircraft leasing and, and the current environment we're in. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, indeed, when uh, documenting safety takes more than doing safety, then we need to look a bit critical at what we're doing. So very interesting presentation. Uh, I would like now to invite uh, Eugene and uh, to, to ask him, how does Eugene Quigley, uh, the CEO of the largest uh, ACMI operator, the largest wet lessor in Europe, how do you see the European wet lease market? How do you see it evolve and what are the challenges associated with uh, wet leasing in Europe? Thank you, Edward. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Eugene Quigley. I'm the account role manager and the COO with CityJet. Um, Today, I'm, I'm going to talk about regional um, wet leasing. So even though it has leasing in the word, it has nothing to do with what Mark talked about at all there in the last one, which is specifically to do with the actual aircraft leasing business. This is to do with providing leasing as a product. Um, it, I'm going to specifically talk about the regional market, which is sub 100 market. And uh, just to give you a little brief city jet, uh, CityJet today um, is a independent wet lease provider. Started as an airline 26 years ago, um, doing scheduled services to London City. And today it is a fully independent wet lease provider and we provide services to a number of mainline European airlines such as SAS, Aer Lingus, SM Brussels, something with Lufthansa, 
uh, and uh, basically what I'm going to talk about now is wet lease. So I'm sure most of you know what wet lease is, but it basically is the provision of aircraft crew maintenance and insurance, ACMI, for a guaranteed minimum of block hours per month. So effectively it's everything other than the ticket sales, the fuel and the ground handling. Now, why, why, why should an airline wet lease? Well, basically, it allows airlines to hire in both short-term and long-term capacity solutions. It permits airlines to focus on their own operation without the resources, risk, people, or aircraft of small gauge aircraft, specifically when we talk about regional market. And it's simple cost-effective capacity as a service solution without a major investment on support infrastructure. So it, it prevents, er, the main lines don't have to worry about investing in smaller air, air, aircraft and actually managing those. Uh, it provides an alternative formula to continuing to compete with low cost carriers for the lowest possible seat cost, but being competitive with frequency and low, with a lower footprint cost per flight. Now that's a mouthful and I'll explain that, but basically it means that what it allows is, rather than competing with some of the low-cost carriers, which a lot of the airlines can't actually do in Europe today, they can put smaller gauge aircraft in on frequency, on hubs that they want to feed. And that, prevent, that means that they can compete, at least from a frequency point of view, for their passengers. So <coughs> passengers can still use their services. And basically, it's the right gauge, right price for feed for hubs. So, where are we today with the market? So the European market is still in development compared to the American market. The American market is generally made up of independent providers with long-term strategic partnership agreements, 10 years or plus, and have more global union agreements. So what that means basically is, I think they're about 10 years ahead of us really, and they, the, a lot of the American suppliers are independent, they're large suppliers, and they have say 10 to 15 year agreements with the main lines. So that allows them to plan at a very strategic level. In Europe, it's only starting to become recently in the last couple of years a number of bigger independent suppliers. Up to this stage, it was really uh, as associates or uh, subsidiaries of the main lines that did a lot of the regional wet lease work in for the airlines, such as uh, KLM, City Hopper, BA City Flyer. They're still around, but now other bigger independent uh, providers such as Nordica, Air Nostrum, ourselves, are now getting into the market. Uh, the main, one of the main differences between the American market and the European market is um, uh, America can have union agreements acro across each state which are applicable everywhere, whereas in Europe it tends to be more regional when it comes to union agreements, which is a significant difference. So the challenges from a from a wet lease provider point of view is, as I said today, a lot of the, a lot of the contracts are shorter contracts. So they, they have a, a higher risk for, for the providers, both from an investment and a return point of view. That also is not conducive to crew stability, so the training costs and standards. So if you've only got a contract for a couple of years in a certain base, having to invest in crew training, recruitment, all that sort of stuff for one base, it's really not conducive so you need a longer, longer term contract, which is also good from a safety point of view, because you're training people, you're keeping them, pilots and cabin crew, and that means that it basically it's a, it's a safer product because you're getting a longer term out of them. You're not, one of the main issues we have as a regional small airline, or smaller airline, is the pilot pool. So obviously the drag on pilots, which has been particularly noticeable in Europe over the last couple of years. I know it seems to have calmed down a little bit now, but it seemed to drag mainly from the regional pilot pool. So that, that puts pressure on the, on the regionals. And once again, if you've got long-term capacity agreements with the main lines, what, you, what they tend to do in the States is they filter some of the pilot recruitment and it eventually ends up being with the main line. So there's this sort of, it, it basically it allows a transition from pilots to the regionals into the main lines. One of the big issues we have is we operate all across Europe. We basically, at the moment, we have 10 different bases in 10 different countries. So we go all the way up from, up, well, our operations are all the way north right down to, to uh, mainland Europe. 
So I think yesterday, I wasn't here yesterday, but I know you had winter operations as one of your issues. And that's, that's, a big, that's a big issue for an airline. So maintaining a standard across all of those, that theater of operations is a challenge. Uh, we also have to deal with a lot of specific aircraft or airline audits ourselves. So we get the likes of the Lufthansa CARA audit and other customer requirements. So each customer will have its own different requirements that we have to fulfill. Uh, across Europe, you have a lot of cultural and language differences and region-specific labour laws and union requirements. So that's one thing as a global European, which you don't tend to have in the States. And finally, really, the most important point for us is really trying to establish longer-term strategic partnerships between airlines and wet lease providers, because as I said, that leads to stability in the market for us and stability to providers. And that's it. Thank you very much, Eugene. So uh, we see that this trend will continue and most likely will emulate what happens in the other parts of the world. Um, I will now invite uh, Cesar Holzem uh, to eFly Germany as part of a uh, larger pan-European group with uh, five AOCs in five uh, member states. And because of that, I want Cesar to tell us what is the extent of aircraft uh, leasing within TUIFLA in Germany? How is it being managed? Also considering the intra-group dynamics and the seasonality of their business, since they are uh, active in the leisure business uh, primarily. Over to you, Cesar. Okay. Thank you very much, Eddard. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you have a good time here. I do. And uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, share some insights with you uh, about um, leasing operations in a tourist um, airline, in a leisure industry airline, and uh, especially in an airline that is um, together within a group of similar airlines, and that is, in my case, the TUI group. Um, why am I here? Honestly, I don't know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I like it. <laughs> um, no, basically, um, let me say, I'm a big fan of EASA and what they do. Um, we, have a, we have a good relationship uh, established over the years, and um, a lot of things have become much easier since we have a common European air law, and uh, I wonder what the future will bring, but if you think about... Um, um, <laughs> a tourist group that is set up in five different European member states, uh, then a uniform air law standard makes it much easier um, to uh, synchronize your operation and to uh, exchange aircraft in between the different AOCs. Um, we have some experience there, especially since we are seasonally driven. Uh, the market that we serve is a season market, it's, it's a tourist industry, it's, it's Simply, it's connected to people's vacation, to your vacation in particular. And uh, I'd like to share some insights with you today. Just give, let me just give you a brief wrap-up about what TUI, what TUI Flight does. Um, we're the yeah, German airline branch of the TUI Group. The TUI Group is the world's largest uh, tour operator, or at least one of the world's largest tour operator. Um, Although it's, it, it's very sad to see competitors uh, to leave the market, um, there are uh, some business opportunities ahead of us um, due to the recent events um, that you all know about. And um, we have um, partner airlines uh, that are um, very similar to us in the United Kingdom, in Sweden, the Netherlands and Belgium and uh, in particular, the Swedish airline is also serving the <laughs> Finnish market. Um, TuiFly itself is operating some 35 plus Boeing 737-800, a very reliable aircraft. Um, the MAX was planned to join us uh, in 2019. Uh, it did not, um, for reasons that you all know about. And uh, for example, that is creating another gap that we have to fill, and we fill this with lease capacities, of course. And um, we uh, hire seasonal wet lease um, providers uh, in, in, in a scale of up to three aircraft, 
Um, that doesn't sound very much three aircraft only. Um, I was just attending a, a conference in, 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 uh, in the United States and there were some major airlines and they were just uh, overbidding themselves with, oh, we have 800, we have 900, oh, we have 1,002, and there was with 35. Um, that gave me a hard time. But um, if you think about a, a, a group or a company with 30, only 35 airlines and you, uh, you operate three, then you're talking about almost 10%. Um, we do mainly short and medium haul to typical tour de tourist destinations around the Mediterranean, Canary Islands, Northern Africa, the Gulf region, um, you name it, but uh, that's uh, all the areas where people like to go, especially for the summer vacation. Um, historically, we are um, also serving the, um, the low-cost market by um, operating seven aircraft on an ACMIO basis for Eurowings. That is um, uh, historically remain from um, from the Air Berlin bankruptcy because we were tied together with Air Berlin before. Um, but that is um, important here because it makes us a lessor ourselves. We're not only a lessee, we're also a lessor. And um, so we know both sides of the business. We have a, we had long haul operations to the Caribbean in particular. Um, maybe there's a business opportunity for that again in the future. And this uh, market was served with dry lease capacities that we took over from other um, group airlines. And uh, so we're also talking about our experiences in dry lease here. Um, I will give you a, 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 an example on this. Um, the TUI group with the five airlines, they have one uh, um, airworthiness organization, one CAMO. And having established this, it makes it quite easy to interchange aircraft in uh, between the group airlines. Although there, is some, um, there are some requirements for acceptance to the National uh, um, Aviation Authority, um, you have one single standard and, picking up what you said, Mark, it, uh, it gives you easy access to uh, the, 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 the records and the records, the records are of a standard that is the same for all of us. And uh, so this is uh, just one basic, um, one basis to make it easier to interchange aircraft on a dry lease basis. And um, what we do here and what I'd like to share with you is a, is a short insight that we, uh, uh, that we handle our leased in operators under our safety management system. Um, we not go only go shopping on the market and, and uh, pick up um, some uh, aircraft um, on an ICMO basis, but we're also trying to, um, to establish a relationship, a partnership with that operator and to manage this operation our, uh, under our safety management system. It's in the very beginning though, I must admit, but um, at least um, we are um, working on this and I think it um, also underlines that we have some awareness there that leasing does not mean um, just uh, hiring somebody doing your job. It also means you make it part of your product and you want to make sure that it meets your quality standards and your safety standards because that is one of the things that we still sell to people. Um, the why. Why do we do this? As I said before, this is just a, just a short wrap up. Um, we are seasonally driven, so this is um, our business emergence throughout the year. It's typical for uh, tourist operators, uh, tourist airlines. And uh, basically, you somewhere set um, a, a boundary. Um, you somewhere have one where you can uh, say, well, we can cover this with our own aircraft. It can be up there, but then you have a lot of overcapacities throughout almost half of the year. You can also lower it down to there and say we're only um, having capacities of our own for the, uh, for the worst month in the business and everything else we, uh, we um, lease in. It's, it's just an example, so it means you can shift it either, you can uh, put it up there or bring it down a little bit, but basically when you have a seasonal business and uh, you see that the, the, um, um, the gaps in between the winter and the su uh, in between summer and winter, they are really significant, um, then you have an area where you, uh, f uh, where you fill up your capacities with leased in. Um, and that usually is when this guy um, comes up, 
and says, well, yeah, I, that's a very good thing, but uh, we can make it work in both directions. Because um, when we have undercapacities, we need to lease in, but during the winter we have overcapacities and maybe we can lease out. And that's what we actually do. Um, we gave away some of our aircraft during the winter into other areas of the world in particular. There we are uh, in a, in a, in a pan-Europe or in an international business, especially we lease aircraft to Canada, sometimes to the United States as well, which makes it a little bit tricky in terms of uh, standards. But um, ironically, for some reason, the Canadian holiday market is completely upside down compared to um, to the European, um, of course, if it's minus 20 degrees in Toronto throughout uh, f four months in the winter, you uh, somehow feel the urge to leave there for at least two weeks. Um, and um, so that's uh, basically it's, it's a thing of capacity management that we do there. And um, so we do it in both directions. We are a lesser and a lessee in the, in the very same business. But if this guy steps in, then it's not long before the other guy steps in and says, well, yeah, but think about uh, the, um, uh, how we can do it and how we can actually do it safely. Um, we're not, as I said before, we're not le just leasing in. We're also trying to uh, um, connect, interconnect this uh, with our safety management system, and we have some, um, uh, some strategies here that I'd like to share with you. Uh, Intergroup um, lease operations are quite easy. As I said before, we have one uh, CAMO, and uh, we also have a metrics organization um, that uh, brought together um, the standards, the uh, standard operating procedures, the procedures and the standards uh, of all the five airlines on one common basis. So we more or less have um, one common operations manual and other operations manual. It's in the beginning and it's more in a, in a, in a shadow area yet. There are also some um, national peculiarities that we have to respect, but uh, there is a tendency to uh, synchronize this and uh, that also makes it easier to uh, exchange the aircraft and even to exchange crews. However, we do not do so yet. Because that, and I like to pick up what Eugene said before, uh, that is because uh, you have so different national labor standards all over Europe. Um, <coughs> when we lease in operators from the market, we audit them prior and during their employment under the TUI Fly SMS. Um, and that is uh, quite, I think that's uh, quite a good step because uh, it's not just that you have somebody working for you, you also try to set up a, uh, a partnership with them and uh, you, you make sure that they meet your quality standards. Um, and that also brings in a very important aspect here in uh, respect to your employees. It brings in trust. Because from an employee's point of view, you ask yourself, what does it mean to my working place, to my company, to my business, if my employer starts to lease in aircraft? And um, making sure that we're not just uh, substituting working places, that we do this to, um, to uh, enhance our product and to give us uh, a business opportunity or to um, give us flexibility um, in terms of business um, opportunities um, is something that we communicate actively into our workforce. Um, as I said before, this is an attitude thing, but I think this is very important. We do not see them just as capacity providers, we see them as partners. And uh, one long-term goal that we, uh, that we strive for is to establish a sort of a trusted partner register, um, that you have a list of uh, airline operators uh, that can provide, provide capacities and that you are sure you worked with them before, it wor worked well, and you uh, are likely to uh, give your business away to them again. Am I done already? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am. I, I have a, a look at the, at the clock. Um, I am done, more or less. We will have uh, some more insights during uh, uh, the discussion. One thing that is uh, important to me and I'd like to point out here again is, um, I hope the gents forgive me for saying so, but we have a chance here to bring out uh, leasing out of the shady area of the <laughs> business. Um, 
Uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a business necessity somewhere, and it's also an ecological necessity these days. Because when talking about capacity management, then you have the problem either you uh, have uh, overcapacities and you will operate half full aircraft with all that impact it has on the environment, or you make sure you maintain a very, very high workload, as we do in our company. Our workload is 98% plus throughout the year and that is due to the lease operations. And there is a, there is a very, very uh, simple um, ecological reasoning behind this. It's better to operate full aircraft than half full aircraft, because what you do not do in the business is you have an aircraft and you just have it standing around there somewhere on the, on the parking lot in Seattle, for my example. Um, and the other thing is, um, and I, I will be ready in one minute, Eduard. Um, <laughs> The other thing is, there are also um, why, why do we, um, why do we uh, interconnect with our uh, leasing partners that, um, that tight is another simple reasoning. What you don't like to see as a responsible manager is sticking one of your aircraft tail signs out of a field of debris, smoking debris uh, after a, um, a disaster or something. It is. Um, kind of a self-assurance to make sure that they meet your uh, quality standards because um, you remember probably the Bergen Air accident that uh, happened in the 1990s of uh, Puerto Plata. That was one of the worst disasters uh, for a tour operator company uh, in terms of lease operations. And um, nowadays, if, you, uh, if you're not only doing short-term leasing, you're doing it uh, long-term for a whole season, you... Um, Maybe you give the, the, the leased aircraft, you give it your, your, your livery, or at least you put some of your logos onto that aircraft, and then you are responsible for this. Uh, it doesn't help you anymore if you say, well, that there was a leased in, uh, aircraft. It, it will be connected to your product and to your uh, company uh, if something goes wrong, and you don't want to end up in a situation like this. So I think that's a quite a, um, understandable and, and reasonable um, um, motivation, why it's so important to have a good relationship with your lease partners. Thank you much for your attention so far. Thank you very much, uh, Cesar. Very interesting and uh, thank you for letting us having a peek within this intricate uh, arrangement of leasing within, leasing in, leasing out. Uh, it's a fun world, I guess. And I see already a, a common thread between you and, and Eugene. The need of, of building partnership is not a one-off. Uh, I do not agree with you that this is a shady business. It is the business or part of the business. Uh, leasing happens all over Europe, uh, but I think Ireland stands out. Uh, and no surprise that we have the Irish regulator with us, the Irish Aviation Authority. And I would like to invite Piers to tell us what this means from a regulator's point of view. What does this mean from an oversight perspective? Piers, over to you. Okay, thank you, Edwin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I come from the Irish Aviation Authority, and I'll just give you uh, a few regulator perspectives into aircraft leasing. As Edward mentioned, uh, Ireland isn't unique, but uh, we do actually have uh, quite a lot of exposure to aircraft leasing. Uh, coming from a relatively small country, I guess, on the western seaboard of Europe. Uh, we have quite a large aviation industry, uh, but uh, given the geographics, a lot of that industry then will be uh, undertaking its activities on a pan-European basis. Similarly, uh, just to take up on the, the financial leasing aspect, uh, Ireland has quite a long tradition and uh, a strong reputation in, in terms of the uh, aircraft leasing business, and uh, some would say it, it's a, a, the birthplace, if you like, of aircraft leasing. So uh, I'd just like to address a small perspective on that aspect as well. Okay, uh, from the point of view of Irish operators, uh, we have uh, operators in different, uh, all of the different sectors, from very large operators, to uh, more moderate and more small operators. But there is a kind of common thread and we see various uh, business arrangements, if you like, developing. So uh, what we see at the largest uh, level is uh, operators 
you know, I mean, maybe a subsidiary of a commercial group operating ACMO, ACMI only into that group, or you have a substantial group of uh, AOCs and uh, in the same way, I guess, as TUI are uh, leasing, intra-leasing in the group uh, aircraft. Uh, we have uh, operators which operate only ACMI as their business model with various contracts in EU states, and that's, I guess, picking up on uh, uh, Eugene's uh, company and their business model. But we also then have uh, other operators, probably at the uh, smaller end of the scale, where uh, the operator is owned by a parent operator, if you like, and that operator operates ACMI into that business. Now, these are all various business arrangements. Uh, as a regulator, obviously, uh, then we have to provide oversight uh, in, in, the, in accordance with the requirements and uh, just take cognizance, if you like, of these various uh, business arrangements. There is a commonality, though, and what we're finding, uh, obviously, there are AOCs then that have these relationships that are within different member states of, uh, of EU, of EASA, with different competent authorities. Uh, they are, to our mind, just in terms of oversight, long-term arrangements, if you like. They're not just the, the, the uh, short-term uh, leases, you know, for capacity that we might have been used to in the past. That probably means something different to uh, the companies themselves, you know, what is long-term, what is medium-term. But uh, from the regulator's point of view, you know, we have oversight cycles and uh, something is long-term as opposed to uh, medium-term in, in a different way, if you like. The other aspect is uh, what we find that uh, you know, the regulatory requirements are relatively straightforward in actual fact, but it's the implication of these. Uh, we're used to, uh, and just picking up on a couple of themes that uh, arose yesterday, at the end of the day, from a safety viewpoint, safety accountabilities, control of the operation and operational control, these are the key issues, as well as the management system and how effective a management system is. But what we're seeing, just picking up on some of the themes yesterday, we have uh, increasing complexity and in how do we adapt our oversight, if you like, to, to kind of deal with this and benefit safety. So wet leasing uh, is increasing. Uh, as I said, we're seeing emerging scenarios, large-scale wet leasing. Uh, some of the uh, larger groups, for example, are engaging in increasing levels of wet leasing uh, through the various types of business arrangements that I mentioned. And it's becoming a regular feature of our oversight programs. You know, 965, the air operations regulation. As I say, the leasing requirements, you know, dry lease in, dry lease out, wet lease in, wet lease out. We're all very relatively straightforward. I have to say, uh, in terms of dry leasing in the traditional sense, we don't see a lot of it, to be honest. Uh, aircraft coming onto, uh, or coming into Ireland on a dry lease basis tend to come onto our register. And uh, we really don't have very much dry lease out. Uh, so it's largely wet leasing that we're talking about. Um, so I made the point there, just on that uh, top point that I have there, that uh, you have 965 and what's envisaged. But from the company's point of view, they envisage something quite uh, different in some ways. It's a business arrangement, it's a partnership, it's these types of things which uh, is more long-lasting. But if we, as I say, just to bring us back to regulatory oversight, we have organizations, what are the safety accountabilities, and is there, you know, what complexities are brought in there? Who is the decision-making mind at any time? The operator business models migrating towards the various group arrangements, as, as uh, we pointed out. We also have the group operations dynamic. Now, uh, you mentioned this in relation to TUI. Certainly, there are a lot of things going on in the group operations dynamic. One, uh, you have these AOCs cooperating. Now, some will uh, see, obviously, aircraft interchange is, is a big part, and wet leasing seems to be the main device that is used to interchange aircraft uh, between AOCs. But there's another uh, efficiency driver, which will be towards what we know as interoperability, i.e. crew interoperability. You know, you've pointed out a few challenges, I guess, you know, which uh, kind of uh, comes to things like labor law and unions and stuff like that. But there are a lot of other challenges in terms of the training standards, meeting the regulatory requirements when a crew member might go from one AOC to the other. All that presupposes that a group of airlines has a, you know, same procedures, if you like, same training standards, and that's a completely different dynamic. But it does actually complicate the whole idea of wet leasing, interchange of aircraft, then possible interchange of crew. 
So from the regulator's point of view, there are a number of challenges. More complex oversight need, new intrinsic risks are emerging. Now what I mean by intrinsic, just by, by the nature of these relationships. Uh, EASA, in fairness, since uh, about 2014, had put together a, uh, you know, a, a, a working group, if you like, uh, that uh, addressed or sought to address what are the key risks that are emerging <coughs> in these particular uh, dynamics and uh, produced a document in 2017, which does, in fairness, uh, highlight some of the key risks. But that's, uh, you know, that's where it is at the minute. I understand there is uh, work completing that uh, maybe by the end of this year and certainly into next year uh, will just help uh, identify the risks. But from the uh, NAA's point of view, obviously there's a continuing challenge just in terms of, of oversight. What does it mean? Just picking up on a couple of the themes that arose from yesterday is collaboration. And uh, we, we do have it in regulation, of course, that uh, NAA's cooperate all the time. Uh, certainly us in Ireland, uh, we're used to dealing because of the nature of uh, our operators and their operations in member states. We do have a lot of collaboration, but actually, you know, when it comes to wet leasing and the scale of it, we do expect that that level of cooperation between uh, supervisory authorities, basically the uh, competent authorities in each member state is going to have to increase. Uh, a couple of the things that are challenges that are posed then are, for example, uh, is there a critical mass to this? You know, if you have an operator and they wet lease in, well, is there, is there a finite number or can the bulk of the operation be wet leased in? And that actually poses particular challenges because don't forget, a regulatory authority for that operator in the state of the operator only has sight of, if you like, that part of, you know, of the the operation, the operator that's, uh, if you like, uh, certified in their state. And of course, there are potential issues with ACMOA only business models, nested uh, arrangements, you know, that can get quite complex and uh, pose particular problems. So that's it just on the wet leasing. Uh, just a few words on the dry leasing. Uh, primarily, as I said, uh, we don't see much of the tr what we might have uh, traditionally thought of dry leasing, but we do have substantial financial leasing with uh, most of the uh, main aircra world aircraft lessers, if you like, based in Ireland. Uh, it is government policy, Irish government policy, and has been, there's a long tradition of this, uh, to support the aircraft leasing sector. It's a very important sector to uh, the Irish economy. Uh, so in that regard, uh, we if you like, uh, the Irish Aircraft Register uh, does support the idea of foreign leased aircraft being on the Irish Register. Now, this is not commercialization of the Irish Register, but it is a method by which uh, the aircraft leasing industry can be supported, but it does bring with it quite a heavy and onerous oversight responsibility. I mentioned there just EU versus non-EU. It's kind of intra-EU versus extra-EU, if you like, clearly with uh, in the European context with the EASA as a regional safety oversight organization. From the Irish point of view, it is much easier to be able to engage in what's known as Article 83 biz agreements, whereby oversight responsibilities in terms of state of registry oversight responsibilities can be transferred to the other member state. Uh, now, I know it's a matter of some discussion that's at various levels uh, within the, the EU, but certainly uh, within the context of the EU, that is a relatively straightforward uh, uh, exercise for us. When we do it globally, i.e., you know, we have uh, obviously conducted uh, 83 bits agreements with the Russian Federation, with Mexico, with uh, Mongolia, for example, and other global states, and we have a long tradition of doing this. Uh, there again, so what are the, the additional measures that we take? And uh, uh, one of the things is on the certificate of airworthiness, we do it on an annual basis, which means our airworthiness inspectors are traveling the globe, if you like, to take care of the airworthiness of the aircraft and issue the uh, reissue, the C of A, on an annual basis. Of course, there's some uh, residual risk, you know, and uh, in that regard, uh, risk to the Irish Aviation Authority is, is uh, what I'm talking about here, reputational risk. We do have combined airworthiness and uh, flight operations inspectors and we do travel to these operators. Now, because it's an 83 bits agreement, clearly oversight has been transferred, so it is not conducting oversight in the traditional sense, but what it is is just satisfying ourselves that the safety posture of that particular operator uh, and the operation is being carried out to our satisfaction. 
Uh, lastly, uh, just to pick up on what Mark said, uh, you know, when aircraft then are on AOC, that's when the 83 bis agreement is, if you like, live. When it comes off AOC, of course, then you're into a, 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 a different type of thing, and uh, we do exercise quite a lot of oversight just in the terms of ferry flights, demo flights, and all these types of things that are involved, if you like, in the transition to another customer. So that just a little bit of a flavor of the types of oversight that we do just in relation to aircraft leasing, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Piers. Uh, interesting. Uh, it's, it's clear that as business grows and evolves, so have to do the, the regulators to be on top of, uh, of this uh, activity. And uh, interesting to see what this in, implies in real life for an operator like the Irish Aviation Authority. Okay. Uh, now, speaking of IASA, or IASA, when it comes to air operations, we have responsibilities in rulemaking and standardization, third country operators, SAFA, RAMP. Uh, Claudio, how do you see from the other's perspective, aircraft leasing operations in, in Europe. Thank you, Edward. Good morning, everybody. Yuva Huomenta. Very happy to be in Helsinki. Thanks for the opportunity. So, uh, for a change, I will try not to go on death by PowerPoint. And I only have two slides with me because many things have already been said, and I'll try hard not to repeat them, but rather to add a couple of things from the ASA perspective. So what are we doing today and what we could do tomorrow with regard to the topics that have been discussed? First things, or first thing that come to my mind is whether we have the right regulatory environment. And we realized some time ago that in fact, in our safety rules, we have aspects when it comes to leasing that in fact are no longer a safety concern because some requirements when it comes to approval of intra-EU leasing haven't really changed since the JEA times. And at that time, it was one system but still quite diverse, whereas now we are all supposed to have exactly the same standards, the same level of safety, and so on. So why having a safety approval issued by a safety authority when it comes to intra-EU leasing? So one area of work for us is to have a better alignment or better coordination between market access regulations. I'm thinking about Regulation 1008-2008. Many of you are probably familiar with that, which is also undergoing a significant review nowadays and the safety regulations, and to disentangle them and to have all approval aspects related to finance, economics, entering the EU market in the economic regulation, and have the safety regulation as lean, as clean as possible, removing all unnecessary steps. This goes, I believe, also in the direction of what Mark mentioned as an expectation from the regulators. Uh, we are also working on a better regulatory framework for group operations. Our rules were developed, were invented at a time where group operations was the exception, whereas nowadays group operations are more and more the business of the day. And our rules do not really uh, prevent that from happening, but they also don't facilitate that, that don't make that particularly easy. So we need to amend, to update, to evolve, in order to give clarity to the regulators and to the industry on the right way to tackle group operations from the safety perspective, which is our angle of view. And this leads me to the last bullet point in the first, no compromise, no shortcuts on safety. We also need to ensure, our role is to ensure that we facilitate on one hand the development that the market is asking for, while ensuring that there is no adverse effect on the level of safety that we have achieved and that we want to maintain and improve further in the years to come. Then I wanted to share with you another thought. We've heard several times this morning the fact that in EU we have one system. We have achieved one system. It's quite an achievement. I think it's an achievement to be proud of. And other jurisdictions are looking at us with some interest because it's a system that works. However, it's not something that we can just take for granted. 
and sleep over it and say, okay, done, box ticked, now we can do something else. No, it's something that needs to be defended and to be uh, monitored every day. I'm thinking of what we call in EASA jargon, standardization. You know that EASA, one of our core activities is to monitor the uniform implementation of the common rules by all member states. This is a fundamental enabler and a prerequisite to ensure that, for example, intra-EU leasing can be a piece of cake. It only works if, indeed, we can trust each other, certificates, approvals, oversight activity, and so on. So we think that the ASA has played a role and has to keep <coughs> playing this role in giving the system the necessary level of confidence that, yes, it's one system, and regardless if you're in Finland or if you're in Italy or if you're in Portugal, in Ireland, if you're in Europe, you have one system with one level of safety. And we can trust each other. This is not only something where EASA needs to act, this is something where primarily national competent authorities need to act. And one need, one expectation that was mentioned earlier by peers, but not only, is the exchange of information amongst competent authorities. If they do it right, then leasing, intra-EU leasing becomes a piece of cake. Maybe I'm exaggerating a bit. Some authorities communicate very well. The IAEA is a very good example. Other authorities still struggle to enter into this mindset of sharing, of being proactive. And, and, but cooperative oversight is an essential enabler for the market of 2020 and beyond. And one small provocation at the end of this first slide, are we, our authorities, making the best use of industry standards? There are industry standards out there developed by the industry for their own needs. And in time, we've seen them growing, becoming stronger, becoming more reliable, and so on. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, about IOSA, the standard developed by IATA. And regulators, I think, are still quite conservative when it comes to using them. Of course, there's no such thing as blind trust. You cannot just take an industry standard at face value. But for, be, there's something in between taking it at face value and completely ignoring that. So you can probably strike a balance and say, okay, we trust it to that extent, we use it to that extent, we take that into account to that extent, and then we do our own stuff. Are we doing this now? Are we making the best use of industry standard? I'm not really convinced. I think there's room for improvement here. And then here comes the, the idea, uh, I wouldn't say a provocative idea, just an idea. You know that in EU, since five years now, we have developed a system called TCO, Third Country Operators Authorization, that has replaced all the national authorizations that were issued by European member states to allow a foreign, a third country operator to perform commercial air transport from to the European Union, We've taken it over, we've centralized it, and now EASA is issuing a single DC authorization to any carrier, to any foreign carrier that wants to fly to Ireland, to Italy, to Finland, whatever. It's called TCO. And at the time, many foreign operators and many European operators that wanted to lease in, to wet lease in, some foreign operators said, wow, great, so TCO is all we need if we want to wet lease in Mongolian Airlines. And we said, no, sorry, too bad. It's not enough because with TCO, we assess compliance with regard to ICAO, which is the baseline to fly safely amongst international partners. But our EU requirements when it comes to wet leasing of a foreign aircraft require a demonstration of an equivalent level of safety to the EU rules, not to ICAO. If you want one example, FTL. If you open the ICAO book and you look for FTL, you don't really find much. You find two lines saying you have to have FTL. Whereas in Europe, FTL is quite a serious thing. So the idea is, today, each operator needs to demonstrate to the satisfaction of its competent authority 
that the foreign operator that they would like to rightly lease in has an equivalent level of safety in terms of ops and airworthiness rules. Tomorrow, we could think of a TCO plus scheme, which will not cover any market access elements. So all the aspects that are today regulated by Regulation 1008 would remain there. But in terms of safety, purely in terms of equivalent level of safety, there could be a TCO plus voluntary scheme, not required, not necessary, but a sort of assessment performed by IASA that says, yes, this third country wet lesser is meeting, has an equivalent level of safety when it comes to ops and worthiness. Hence, it's eligible to be wet leased in by an EU operator. And this could be another way of making efficiency gains at system level. It's an idea, it's far from being uh, implemented tomorrow, but it could bring some further added value, could be another as a contribution to more efficiency in the system. And I promise to keep it short, so despite being Italian, I will try to <laughs> keep it short indeed. Thank you very much again and looking forward to the next questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudio. Thank you very much to the whole panelists. Um, I hope you enjoyed the, the discussions. We wanted to bring different facets, complementing each other, to make the story of leasing round. Um, now, since I'm moderator, I, had the, I get to ask the, the first questions before opening the, the questions for the audience. And I have one that I think it's, it's valid for the entire panel, so everyone can chip in. Uh, and it's about SMS. So we all see and, uh, and accept that SMS is a key enabler of safety in, in nowadays. Uh, moving from a prescriptive world to a performance one, we need to manage that performance and measure it and be ready to, to act when indicators show us that we need to do that. Uh, but when it comes to leasing, what would be the particularities to consider and give special consideration in the context of, of SMS? And a follow-up question is how important it is that the SMS of the lessors and of the lessees are interconnected. Who wants to, to open the discussion? Yeah, okay, okay. well, I can, I can certainly speak from my experience with, with this. Uh, the, you know, having the actual uh, lessors and lessees uh, SMS um, system related, or at least meeting the requirements of the actual operator's uh, SMS system is, is fundamental, I think, in, in the whole program. Uh, and to have a successful partnership. Uh, our experience generally is that, I suppose from, you will have a very high, generally on the sort of main lines, we'll have a highly developed SMS <coughs> management system. And to ensure effective safety for their um, passengers that they're going to be leasing out now on a, on a wet lease operator, they, they have to ensure that there is at least a correlation of the two SMS systems, and that you'll find that generally that, um, you know, in the past, and I think to be fair, um, Cesar was talking about the shady element of it. This is where th it needs, you know, there, there was a view that, you know, you would have a cheaper element from a wet lease provider, really, where it didn't have a developed safety management system. And that's really the league that we are sort of getting out of really you know you have to get a, a highly developed sms system which really has to correlate to one similar to uh, main airlines which which have been de under development for years really. and, and it's it's fundamental because effectively the the you know they're selling the ticket and they're responsible for the passenger that's effectively what, what happens that you know we are we, uh, although the operator is also responsible the, the the provider who's selling the ticket is as well so they have to ensure it, it is the same product effectively. Maybe. Thank you. Cesar? Yeah, I'd like to, to uh, complete this from the other um, side of the business. Um, in a perfect world, uh, interconnecting the SMS systems of the lesser and the lessee would be perfect. We're not that far yet, I think. Um, uh, we all must agree, but because letting the other party look into, uh, in, in, into your SMS m requires a lot of trust and, and means also that you let down your pants significantly. Um, <laughs> True. I'm quite idiomatic, right? Um, 
On the other hand, uh, a first step is that you ask your question. You're, you're not looking for, uh, for a, a lease partner just to buy in some, some cheaper uh, elements. I, I like it very much that you addressed it um, uh, this way. You like somebody who can provide capacities and you can, who, who can complete your business seasonally or long or short term, whatever. And that means also uh, you have to ask yourself within your SMS, uh, the company that we hire for this job, do they have the competence? Do they fit into our operations? For example, um, as a tourist operator, uh, we, we fly into all those spots where people like to go. A lot of them are Mediterranean islands, Greece, for example. And uh, the, the airports there are quite demanding. I mean, they have good weather, though. You, you never run into um, winter ops uh, um, uh, issues, but they only have non-precision approaches, shorter runways and everything, uh, terrain rising and, and so on. And if you hire a company that just has experience in flying to major hub airports, where you have uh, perfect ATC and precision approaches and everything, then it's, it means that uh, the business that you hire them for may be new to them. That does not mean that they are not able to do so, because I think that's a, a basic pilot competence um, to do non-precision approaches. But you want to see that they also have this on their screen, that they also are aware of it, that uh, um, they may go into so, uh, particular areas of operation where they are not um, experienced yet. Yeah. Claudio? Can I volunteer? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'd like to revert your question. So we've seen in the past cases where we sample an undertaking, an operator, in our sanitization activity, and this uh, operator has a mature SMS. And they are proud of that and showcase and look, it's good, we have KPIs and everything. And then one of our auditors says, yeah, but tell me something about that operation. And the answer is, ah, no, 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 that's, that's, why not? Well, that's wet leased in from some, so it's not us, it's them. That's a terribly wrong answer because <laughs> Even if they can say, okay, something happens, it's under their AUC, but as in the panel we said, no, it's your tail, it's your brand, it's your image, it's your ethical responsibility, you're selling tickets. So if you say that that does not belong to your SMS, you got something fundamentally wrong. I hope I've been clear on that. And I think the, another key aspect is that uh, the lesser company retains operational control and that, you know, that has a lot of meaning, and that's uh, one of the concerns if you're the competent authority for the lessor or for the lessee. But in the case of a lessor, uh, you know, what is the scope of the operation specifications that there isn't pressure to kind of go beyond what the uh, operator is, is authorized to do under their, uh, uh, their op specs. Other aspects, um, clearly, you know, the relationship uh, could be that of, you know, a strong partner versus uh, those that are, uh, if you like, uh, the lesser company that's uh, providing the aircraft into the uh, operation. And uh, it's important, you know, that the key risks, you know, from the point of view of the oversight, that the key risks have been identified. For example, just to pick up on your point, you know, whether the scope of the operations is into uh, non-precision type uh, uncontrolled airspace, you know, uh, uh, airfields, for example, that are uh, not within the normal kind of scope of operations of the, uh, the lesser. So there's a lot of risks that need to be identified, but the key point is that the uh, operation control is retained and exercised correctly by the, the lesser in those sort of relationships. But, uh, you know, in the context of uh, agreements, there'll always be something within the agreements, you know, the contractual arrangements and, and agreements about reporting, and obviously reporting is a key uh, input into, into the SMSs. But uh, you know, what we're seeing certainly with the longer term arrangements is that uh, the management systems, it's also compliance systems of course, where there's obligations on um, the, the lessee, if you like, to uh, undertake the compliance aspects of uh, that the lessor is meeting all the, uh, the relevant requirements. So there, there's a lot more to it, uh, I guess, than just the SMS. So sorry. If I may, yeah. we can bring it down to one provocative question. Um, do you like the lessor? to do things that you can't do in your, because of your SMS. In terms of a shortcut of mm. safety, definitely no, no way. You don't hire it just to do the things that, that your SMS tells you are uh, too critical. But if it's the company that has more competence in some areas, 
for example, when you start long haul flying that you did not do yet, then it can be a reasonable way uh, and even a safer way because your SMS tells you that you're not experienced yet and that you, that you need extra training, for example, but there's another company that identified the risk long before you, you did and uh, did the training and everything and has more competence. Then it can be a positive answer to that question. That's a very interesting point indeed. Uh, leasing is not there to export risk. It's no, there no. to offset uh, efficiency, yeah. risk to offset them, but, but, to not, to ex but not to export be. risk. That's a very interesting point. Thank you very much. Uh, one uh, one follow-up. We, we heard during the, the panel two words, okay, leasing, safety, and business. Do you believe there's a risk that... Um, yeah, the, the advent of, of leasing operation, the, the greater use of leasing will invite some form of um, forum shopping. I'm thinking of uh, yeah, various registries around the world that have very prolific registries themselves and these aircraft never land there and they are all over the world. The same from an inter-European perspective, do you believe this will in invite this type of uh, activities and if they do, are we as regulators and industry ready to be on top of such a challenge? Well, I mean, I'll, if I may start, I mean, mm. uh, clearly uh, with the ASA and its standardization program, you know, that aspect of things, while, uh, you know, if we have uh, aircraft registers, you know, building, 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 and then expecting wet lease in, you know, I mean, there is an expectation that the, the relevant standards are being met. And, uh, you know, it's in the context of EASA as, as our oversight, uh, regional oversight uh, organization that that, you know, that aspect on the standard, the standards should be maintained. Mm -hmm. I, think. I, I guess I can come in mm -hmm. in respect of dry leasing. You know, yeah. there, there is a term now used for like commercial registries, such as, you know, you take Two Reg or San Marino or Guernsey or, or sorry, um, even Cayman Islands or, or, or Bermuda. Um, but you know, from a, a lessor and aircraft owner's perspective, we're out to try and protect the value and the utility of the aircraft, and we will do nothing to affect that. So we want registries which have good safety, good reputation, and really high standards. And, and that's what drives us to registries such as the Irish Registry or the Austrian Registry also does transitioning aircraft. Um, but, but one thing I will say, is that there are times we may be forced to use transition to other registries, and, and they are usually down to the maintenance of the aircraft. So for instance, um, this year Jet Airways went bankrupt and there was a lot of aircraft in India which were operating safely in India and being maintained by Indian organizations. So if I wanted to take our aircraft and say we'd put them onto the Irish register, I had a problem because none of the MROs that were maintaining the aircraft had EASA approval. So I would then place an aircraft on an on a Irish register and not be able to maintain the aircraft. So that's the problem we have. We absolutely want to protect the aircraft, but equally at a practical level, we have to be able to take the aircraft that was being maintained in India and to continue on that until we can remove the aircraft somewhere else and that's what we did, and then we transferred it onto a different register again. So from a dry lessor's perspective, the, the, the costs of Saudi Arabia's registers don't really interest us. What really interests us in maintaining the value, utility, and acceptability of that aircraft going forward. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I think it's time now to open up the, uh, the floor for the questions from the audience. I will move here closer so I can get to see them. The most popular one is, uh, so you, what is in Europe is short term. Uh, how do you ensure cockpit competency when there is cost challenge versus higher training need due to often changing environment? I think it's for, for the lessee, uh, Eugene yeah. and Cesar can chip in on this one. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I suppose fundamentally you have to start off is you have a basic standard in itself. You have a high standard to start with. It's not that you're lowering any standard. But I think the important thing is that you work with some of your partners, which we have done, in improving the standards. So the area of operation, for instance, as an example, uh, we have uh, cold weather operations up in this part of the world, and we have worked very closely with SAS 
to ensure our pilots are meeting uh, you know, the requirements for operating up here with their experience. So effectively, it's not something that cost doesn't come into it as far as I'm saying. And once that goes back down to having a proper SMS system and an accountable system within the company, and, and you're doing business with, a, with a, 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 an airline that's reputable, it'll have all of that. Thank you. So is that the same perspective in TUI? Yeah, um, I think, um, well, of course, th this is a risk. And uh, we discussed this before already, we touched this before. But um, I think that's uh, where, where the auditing that we do is helpful because that's something you can find out when auditing your, your, your partner airline, uh, looking into their, their training at, at least. Uh, I mean, it, it's not really interlocking your, your SMSs, but um, uh, that's something you can address in auditing, say, well, to show me your, your training plan for that particular operation. Um, uh, what do you do to, uh, to cover the risk of that operation? And uh, then it becomes a, a, a case, right? So um, you, do not, you do not blind it out. You, you do not look away, but you look into it. And um, I think this will cover at least some aspects of this risk uh, that is described there in that question. Just to follow up as well, as a wet lease provider as well, depending on who your customers are, but you may have actually more audits and more requirements than you would have had as as a standalone airline. So a smaller standalone airline may not have the same oversight that the likes of uh, we do when we're involved in some of the thing. And some of our audits, you know, they, they'll go into non-regulatory issues, uh, such as <coughs> how, uh, you know, how you recruit people. It'll actually go down to that level. So it, it does enhance, I think, safety, in, in, in certainly in our case, and has done over the last couple of years. So basically, from a lessee perspective, lessor perspective, it's more scrutiny, more safety then. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one for, for for the regulators, uh, Claudio. I think it's it's a yeah. one for you. Sorry for the curveball. There's one Europe, one system, maybe in theory, but there's so many differences on how national authorities oversee operations. Should EASA have a tighter grip? I like that question. Ah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you, Rome was not made in a day. Europe will not be made in a day. And there's still a long way to the United States of Europe. That remains my dream, but it will take a bit of time. Uh, yes, it's one system, but still there are differences, yes. The motto of Europe is united in diversity, and sometimes we're quite diverse. But personally, I think we've gone a long, long way in the last 10 years. Still, there's a lot of uh, way to go. And do we need to have a tighter grip? It depends. I'm not for the whip. I'm rather for better monitoring abilities. We have introduced a few years ago what we called continuous monitoring. So uh, once upon a time, we were auditing NAAs every year, every two years. Now we try to get a grip on them in real time through data, indicators, um, information, and exchange, cooperative oversight, and so on. There's also other possible scenarios. Uh, you know probably that since the latest revision of what we call the basic regulation, so our foundation that says what we can do and what we cannot do, now we have one new tool in our toolbox, which is the possibility for <coughs> EASA to act as competent authority. So if there is a group with several AOCs in several jurisdictions, which is struggling by the fact that in different places they want a bit more red, a bit more blue, a bit more green, then the possibility is to say, well, you know what? EASA can act as competent authority for all your AUCs. And we will not necessarily be the best. I think we are, but don't, don't <laughs> say that loud. But at least we will ensure a single interpretation and a uniform application of the standards. So in a nutshell, still a long way to go, progressing in the right direction and getting better by the day. All right. I, I fully agree with you. <laughs> and um, I will be there to make this happen. Edward, could, I, could I add one comment to that? Please. Um, I, I think EASA has done a fantastic job since it's come. And I, I think what Europe was before and what Europe is now is a totally different animal. And, and I think it's proved itself time and again. The, the one suggestion I would make, though, is that standardization is retrospective. In other words, it's looked back on. While the problems we face in industry are what's in front of you, 
and it would be a great advantage if there was an, an ability to ask EASA a standardization question that you were facing. So a judgment could be made in a relatively short period of time of whether an authority is right or wrong, mm -hmm. and then move on from that. Now you have the frequently asked questions, which is useful, but to be able to have a mechanism of getting a real-time answer you know, in a relatively short space of time would be extremely helpful. All right, uh, one last question. I think it'll be for Cesar. It's, uh, it's one from Werner, KMI. It's what can be done to reduce or eliminate the admin burden for an operator to shorten the time for leasing of aircraft that remains in the same joint organization, I would say, in the same group? Yeah. Um, well, but th th there are two sides to that question. One is uh, simply technical. Uh, make sure that you have the same standards. Here we are with the, with the word standards again. But um, as I said before, what is easy within the TUI group is we have one uh, um, CAMO um, taking care of all the aircraft operated within the group that uh, gives you uh, easy hierarchies. You, you know your, your uh, contact person and everything. Um, you have one single technical system to administer all the paperwork um, or the, 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 the files. Um, that are uh, related to, to the life of an aircraft and to, uh, to that uh, business. It, makes, it gives you a common standard to understand how, how the, uh, the, the file is organized, how the record is organized. Um, but still, you have to, um, to, to call for the, uh, the acceptance of uh, your NAA, and that, that is uh, the, the tr tricky part. Uh, that or th this is not, not tricky, no, that's the wrong word. But it's, it's a little more time consuming. And I, I totally like to, uh, to support um, uh, Mark here saying well, that could be done easier. Uh, and that, mean, that not, does not mean to take away the, the responsibility of the NAA or, or to, to eliminate the NAA, but we can think about ways to, uh, to, f um, yeah, to facilitate this somehow. Thank you. I think we, we also need to be part of that solution. And, and Claudio hinted that uh, adequacy of our rules to cater for group operations needs to be scrutinized and uh, reacted upon when we need to, to make this indeed working, because now this is no longer an exception. It's the, the business reality of, of today's Europe. Uh, I think we, we exhausted our time. Uh, thank you very much for, for your great contribution. Uh, we. We came now to realize that leasing is no longer a shady business, is the business, and because of that, uh, we need to make sure that that business remains uh, true, delivers on its promise, and remains safe. Uh, it's, it's a very good point, and I will make the tagline of, of this panel that leasing is not a tool to export risk, uh, but uh, not by, by no means, and this calls for this to be told by all the safety managers and all contracting managers in all the operators and all the lessors and the lessees. And that will be, let's say, um, the, the, the future work should develop in that direction. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the debate. Uh, thank you for your uh, questions. And I would like to invite you to join me in um, having a big round of applause to the excellent professionals I have in my panel. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, Edward. Uh, thanks to our panelists for extremely interesting discussions, a really interesting topic indeed. Uh, it is time for a well-deserved coffee break now, so um, that will be once again served across the hall. Be back at 11 a.m., 1100 sharp. Thank you very much.